John's Gospel, chapter 19, and the verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon a hyssop and put it to his mouth. And Jesus, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith is true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, the bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore, took the body of Jesus. There came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulchre, wherein was never man yet led. There led they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, where the sepulchre was nigh at hand. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless his word to our hearts. We, we want to eventually turn our attention to verse, well, 28, 29 in there. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, uh, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with the vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Lord Jesus Christ, remember, the Son of God, deity, left the glories of heaven, came down to Bethlehem, born in a manger, humanity. So we have deity and humanity, which can't be easily explained, uh, in one person. We accept it by faith. And there, as a child, humanity, a boy, a teenager, growing up into manhood, it's amazing that the Lord Jesus Christ understands what childhood's like. He understands what boyhood's like and youth's like and adulthood's life. And we have the deity in humanity, but we have the fulfilling of all the scripture prophecies. Some people get very worried about scripture prophecies, especially the ones in front of us. They get in complicated, but all the scripture fulfillment, all the scripture had to be fulfilled for Christ's first coming. And as we read together there, we have the fulfillment of many prophecies. And they're fulfilled in great detail. Very exact. I thirst, I want to drink. Now you know what that's like. Especially when we were out in Uganda there, when we were there, they opened a couple of wells when we were there and I pumped the water and all the children come up and they washed and drank and we had a great time. And thirsty, we need a drink. And even down to the very details of Jesus saying, I thirst, all the prophecies of crucifixion were fulfilled to the smallest detail. And let me tell you, all the prophecies of his second coming, they'll be fulfilled as well. Now, the problem is not with the prophecies and the problem's not with, the, with God. The problem's with us. We don't understand it enough. And we make estimations and guesses and so forth. When I was a wee boy, 
before I became a wee man, I, I heard a preacher preaching that we would only have a few years left and the world would end. But that's 60 years ago. So we need to be so careful. But all the prophecies will be fulfilled, whether we understand them or not. And it says there, in Psalm 69, verse 21, it says, In my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Interesting. In my thirst they gave me... Uh, but vinegar, what does it mean by giving vinegar to drink? I don't think you and I drink vinegar. We take some vinegar maybe in our chips or something like that. But we don't drink it. Wouldn't be good for you. Now I know some old folk take vinegar and honey, but the honey helps it. But Proverbs 10 and 26 says, As vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes. Now my wife and I, we do some barbecuing. We go out and we raise money for the mission board by doing barbecuing. And we have to watch some nights that the barbecue is in the right direction and the smoke's not blowing into your eyes. You stand there crying. And I wonder, what's he crying for? No, smoke. As vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes. So vinegar's not pleasant, friend, to drink. Let's keep it nice and simple. And here's the Lord Jesus Christ. And John 19 and 20, it says, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He says, I thirst. Even in his dying moments, scripture must be fulfilled. God's word must be fulfilled. Every prophecy of Christ's coming at first must be fulfilled. And every prophecy for the second coming must be fulfilled. So, <clears throat> pardon me for saying this, but Christ cannot come back until all these prophecies are fulfilled. Christ couldn't die on Calvary until the very last prophecy was fulfilled. I thirst. God's Son, the creator of all the earth, says, I thirst. The one who put the clouds in the sky and he can't get a drop of water to cool his tongue. The one who made the rivers and the lakes and the fountains and the springs. Somebody, can somebody not give the Lord Jesus Christ a drink? Mark chapter 15, there it says that they had wine and myrrh mixed. Now, I, I looked into this, and I believe this wine and myrrh, it was a medicine. And uh, I believe that, you can disagree if you want, but I believe this medicine was given before the crucifixion, or offered. And then the vinegar comes at the end of the crucifixion. And what happened was, there was wealthy women and they gathered up shekels, money, and they put together this wine and myrrh as a medicine. Morphine, we would call it, something like that. And when someone was being crucified, this strong medicine drink, painkiller, they would give it to the person to ease the pain, but Christ refused that. He wanted to suffer for you and me. Not just, yes, not just for our sin, but for every process we go through in life. Vinegar. There's a saying, you give your best friend champagne and burgundy and the best of wine, but you give your enemy vinegar. There's the meaning, friend. If I went to your house and you give me a glass of vinegar, I'd say, oh, I'm not too welcome here. Give me a cup of coffee, uh, Kenyan coffee or something like that, I'd be more than happy. But there's an insult in this, friend. This is what it means. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're giving him his final insult. They hated him. They hated him. The Lord Jesus Christ was hated by the religious leaders. Why? Because he exposed their hypocrisy. He exposed their greed. He exposed their pride. He exposed their sin. He went and cleansed the temple, I believe, on two occasions. 
throughout the money changers. Now, I can understand why they changed money, but that wasn't to be in the house of God. That was to be in the outside of the temple. People came along from London and they brought their pound coins and their 20 pound notes and they changed their money into shekels to go and buy pigeons, lambs, heifers for sacrifice. So there had to be money exchanged. But that wasn't to be in the house of God. That was to be out in the four courts. They brought it in. There was profit here. The Lord Jesus Christ threw them out. And he said, my house is to be a house of prayer. And you've made it a den of thieves. And so they hated him for what he did in the temple. The time Lazarus took ill and died, it says there that many believed, but they didn't all believe. Tells us that some of them went away, the religious leaders, and they began to plot and plan the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ began to talk about his death. And as he began to talk about his death, Judas was there. You see, Judas liked money. <laughs> we all like money. You can't get on a bus unless you have money. You can't go into a shop and buy anything unless you have money. So we all have to handle money. But, but Judas liked money. And Judas was in with the disciples. And he had believed for a long time that Jesus would be the king of the Jews. And if Jesus was the king of the Jews and he was the treasurer, I think they call it here, the chancellor of the exchequer, he would have a good job, put it that way. He would probably get everything provided, a house and all the rest of it, and he'd get a good salary. If Jesus became the king of the Jews, he would be what? Well, but the Lord Jesus started to talk about dying. And in three days he would rise again, but this wasn't in Judas's plan. Judas thought to himself, how am I going to get some money out of this? If I'm not going to get promotion and into a high position, how do I get some money out of this? And he said, I know the religious leaders hate Jesus and they're planning to kill him. I wonder, could I get some money out of this? And so he goes to religious leaders and he says, I, I, I can set this up for you. And so he set up the Lord Jesus Christ and he sold them for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. Cheap. I tell you, there's people selling the Savior cheap today, aren't they? Yeah. Bottle of stout, if you know what I mean. Drink. Packet of cigarettes. Oh, I, if I was a Christian, I couldn't give up my fags. When I'll keep my fags and go to hell. I'll keep my drink and go to hell. And Judas sold the Lord Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver. And there's others selling the Lord for a bit of business, a bit of popularity, a position. And he sells the Lord, but that money, he couldn't hold it, friend. He couldn't hold it. Jesus goes in for the mock trial. Son of God, and they condemned him. The sinless, spotless Son of God is condemned as a sinner. They tell me that when there's three crosses, the one in the center cross was looked upon as the most evil. They take Jesus, they condemn him, and they scourge him. Now, that scourging must have been terrible because if you read history, some people died during the scourging. And they take him out. They offer him the wine and the myrrh. He refused the medicine. And they hang him on a tree at Calvary. The pain, the nails, the heat, the thirst. Ah, you've got it now, haven't you? He's been a long time since he got a drink. He was taken the previous night there, Gethsemane, been treated, abused, and beaten. Surely there's someone to give the Lord Jesus Christ a drink. 
You understand what I mean, don't you? You've been in hospital, you've watched your mother, your father, someone ill. And you've gone and you've lifted them up and you've put your arm around them and you've given them a drink because you love them. You got a nice cup of tea, a little drink of water, something fresh, and you hold them up and you give them a drink. But there's no one to do that with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's bleeding, he's scourged. And then they take the last insult and they put it to his lips, a sponge of sour vinegar. And he says, it's finished. Sacrifice was finished. Now, if you went to some of our colleges today, they would say, did Jesus really die? Did he die? Some colleges would tell you, well, uh, he, he fainted. He just passed out and then he revived in the cool tomb later on and came out. But we want to put that doubt away for a moment because there's the soldiers and Joseph Arimathea comes in and he says, could I have the body of Jesus? And the soldiers say to Pilate, this man wants the body of Jesus. What do we do? Pilate says, go and see if he is dead. And so the soldiers, they go down uh, to where the Calvary is. I see them climbing up through the garden and they go up to the top and they check the first thief, he's not dead, so they break his legs. The second thief, they break his legs, it means he'll die shortly. And they come to Jesus and they said, he's dead. And one of them says, I'll make sure he's dead. And he put a sword in his side. And out came the blood and water. So if we ask the soldiers, they're going to report back to Pilate. Is he dead? And they go back into Pilate and they said, yes, he's dead. No soldiers knew if you were dead or alive, friend. They were men of war. We'll ask Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. They go down and they lift the cross out. They pull the nails out of the body and they handle the body. And they said, is he dead? Yes, the undertaker always knows if the body's dead or not. Yeah, such a difference between a body that's dead. I don't know, I'm sure most of you older folk have handled a dead body or touched the forehead or a hand or a mother or father. You're dead. We'll ask the women that have been watching. Is Jesus really? Yes, he's dead because we're hurrying home to get some spices. We'll be back on Sunday morning with the spices. He's dead. We, we saw them take the limp body and they put it in the grave. He's dead. Now we ask another question. Did Jesus live again? You go to many religions today and they deal with dead prophets and dead people. Did Jesus live again? Have we got a living Savior? Yes, we have. We, we'll go down to the grave there, to the tomb in the garden, and we'll ask the angels, is Jesus? Oh, they said he's not here, he's alive. He's alive. The tomb, look, look in the tomb, it's empty. We'll ask the women, they come with their spices. Why are you going with your spices? Oh, we're going back home. Why are you taking your spices home? Because he's not there, he's alive. We met him, we were talking to him. We asked Peter. Peter was a rough big guy. He was pretty blunt with his answers, wasn't he? Peter, is Jesus alive? Yes, yeah, surely he's alive. I was talking to him. The 500, there's others. Today Jesus died, but he rose again and he lives. And he fulfilled all the scriptures. And verse 30 says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said it is finished. He bowed his head. He gave up the ghost. He has tasted the bitter things of life for you and me. He's gone that path before us. He has. He understands what you and I go through. Whether that's as a child, teenager, a youth, or an adult. He understands. He drank the bitter cup. Remember the cup that he talked about? His father says, you have to drink the cup, a bitter cup. 
for many years I couldn't understand. If the Lord Jesus Christ spent so many hours in Calvary, he died, he rose again, and he suffered hell for me. But if I go to hell, I'll be there all eternity. How can the Lord put all this into short space of time? There's what we have at home in the cupboard is diluting juice and undiluted juice. (laughs) And I went in one day to the cupboard and I was needing a drink and I grabbed the first bottle and I took a drink and it was undiluted juice and nearly blew the ears off me. (laughs) Terrible stuff. What am I getting at? The cup that Jesus drank was undiluted person that goes to hell diluted it lasts for a long time the Lord Jesus Christ he drank that father's cup and the last part of the cup was the final insult he was given vinegar to drink but he knows what you and I go through he knows when you're insulted he knows when you're going through a hard time let me mention John hard times that he that you and I go through that he understands very quickly. Bereavement. The Lord Jesus Christ understands bereavement, friend. He was told Lazarus was sick. He arrives at the house and they said he's dead. And it said he wept. He wept. You and I know what it is to shed tears. Doesn't matter when you're north, south, east, west, wherever it comes from, those tears are just the same. And here is humanity weeping in Christ. And then he goes down to the graveside and he says, Lazarus comes forth. Lazarus come forth. And there's deity. Man, that's wonderful. Humanity and deity. He knows what we go through, yet with all he can take us through. When you look at a loved one who has died there, the bitterness of death in Christ has been taken away. Been taken away. O death, where is thy sting? To die without Christ, friend, and for your loved ones to stand around and they're not saved without Christ, it's hard. Can I explain what it's like for that person to die in simple form? When we lived in the south of Ireland, we had a little baby girl. Now, we had a problem in our house because we had rats in the house. (laughs) I don't know if you have rats in your house or not. These four-legged ones with tails. (laughs) We have two-legged ones as well, but there's four-legged rats. Our wee girl, we were told, the rat will not touch her if there's no food about. So at night time she got her supper, got nice clean clothes on, washed, and my wife would nurse her till she would go to sleep, or else I would sometimes. And we'd take her upstairs and put her in bed and put her in nice and comfortable. Do you know what that's like? That's like a child of God dying down here. And the Lord Jesus Christ said underneath and round about are the everlasting arms of the Savior. And he nurses his children to sleep down here. And he carries them up into heaven. And they awake in new surroundings in the glories of heaven. My, the Lord Jesus Christ understands bereavement. No night in heaven. No sorrow, no pain for that loved one that passes on. The soul in heaven awaiting the glorious day of resurrection come forth. We woman we know well, we Lucy, her husband died recently. My wife was talking to her the other day and she says, how are you managing Lucy? Oh, she says, not too bad. I just walk and talk with the Savior every day. One day soon he'll take me Friend, that's salvation. (laughs) That that, that makes life worth living. We're going home to glory to be with Christ. Yes. That's wonderful. In bereavement, in times of bereavement, the Lord draws so close. Now, 
in times of betrayal, the Lord grows. Judas betrayed Jesus, didn't he? A, a terrible thing. Psalm 41 verse 9 says, My known familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. So there's the prophecy being fulfilled in Scripture again. And John 13 and 8, John 13 and 18 says, Scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Betrayed. We can understand the Lord drawing near in bereavement, but what about being betrayed? Does the Lord understand and say, does Jesus care? He does. He does. Judas and the Lord Jesus Christ went to church together. They went up to the temple together. They sat down together. They ate food together. And Judas sold his Savior for a few pieces of silver coins. He sold heaven for a bit of silver. Have you and I ever been betrayed? I'm sure you have. Yeah, we do, sure. Someone that ate bread in your home, someone that came to church with you, someone that sat with you, someone at school that you thought a lot of, a friend, a pal, and they turned against you. Yeah, but the Lord understands. He understands. A Savior who sees, a Savior who listens, Times of betrayal, he understands. Times of bereavement, he understands. You know, when you're betrayed and hurt and sore, you are sore, sore and hurt. Maybe someone that you thought so much of betrayed you. Just tell the Lord about it. He's been there before you. He has tasted the vinegar of betrayal. Yeah. It's a hard taste. It's hard to take. What about go a little further poverty? We've got bereavement, we've got betrayal. What about poverty? Now I know in London here you don't have poverty. <laughs> well there's places everywhere in this world with poverty. Even over where we are there's people and they're in poverty. What about poverty? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ had no money in his pocket to call his own. He didn't have money. Judas had the money, and Judas was a thief. Oh, dear. Well, when the Lord Jesus Christ wanted to go across the Sea of Galilee, he had to borrow a boat, hadn't he? When he wanted to go up into Jerusalem, he didn't have a car, he didn't have a Toyota, or uh, whatever, all these Kias and all the rest of it. He didn't have one of them. He had a borrowed donkey. Man. When he died, he was put in a borrowed tomb. And Judas, the treasurer who handled the money, was a thief at Celsius. The Lord knew that. He saw it all happening. It hurts when someone steals your money, doesn't it? Maybe not much, but it, they got it and they took it. and It hurts, so it does. Maybe they break into your home and steal it. Oh my, when we lived over in Newry, Nuri was a hot spot over there, and our house was broken into a number of times, and it really hurts. I went to the cupboard and I had a hundred pound in the cupboard. Actually, it was euros at the time, and it was when he went there, the cupboard was bare. <laughs> it was gone, a lot of other things, and it hurts. Someone buys and doesn't pay. You enter the deal and they walk away with your money and your hurt. Does, under, does God understand these things? Is God interested in my normal life? That's what I'm meaning. Does he understand when we're hurt and poverty and we're trying to pay the bills and it's difficult and how do we get the food on the table and the income and the expense and it's all not fitting together? We were in Liberia. Some of you probably know more about Liberia than we do, but we were talking to Pastor Moses Dawn. And I said, how did you manage during the war time? Oh, he says, God was very good to us. 
He said, we were down in the basement in the cellar of an old house, me and the little congregation of us, and we were very hungry. We hadn't eaten for a long time. And we prayed, Lord, would you please give us some food? And he said, we were watching out through the little window out onto the street, and we heard the soldiers coming in their jeeps down the road. And he said, we looked out, and there was bags of rice in the backs of their jeep, and we said, oh, if we could just get some rice. And as the last jeep came around the corner, he was going too fast and a bag of rice fell off. Pastor says, oh, great, we've got rice. Ah, but the jeep stopped and he reversed back. (laughs) They'll do that in Ireland, you know. (laughs) Reversed back and the guys got out and they went to lift the bag of rice, but the bottom of the bag was torn. And they just left it and they drove off. Pastor Moses went out, him and a couple of others, and they gathered up the bag and all the little bits of rice. And they went in and they had the best boiled rice you could ever make. God understands our poverty. Does God understand our pain? Yeah, he understands. My, what he went through on the cross physically, the scourging, the nails, the pain, He didn't take the medicines. The vinegar, the insult. Just imagine the vinegar and the parched lips and the parched tongue. He understands what you and I go through in pain, the sleepless nights. You understand what it's like to walk about at night. Going down to the cupboard and looking for medicine or a tablet. We've got medicine. We've got tablets. We've got the morphine. We've got the hospitals. We've got the doctors. We've got the chemists with their shelves full of stuff in this country. And what the Lord Jesus Christ suffered in the pain, he understands your pain. He understands my pain. And the spiritual pain, oh, he carried our sin. The pain of sin can be terrible. The pain of Unforgiven sin. My converse so heavy. old pilgrim and pilgrim's progress. The old burden he had on his back, he said it was very heavy. The pain, the vinegar. Very quickly. Division and death. The cross separated Christ from his loved ones. You and I. We've been separated from loved ones too. Does he understand? The cross, there he is, he hung there. He was separated from his heavenly father and he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Ah, that's one thing he has promised that will not happen to us. Because he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Isn't that wonderful? The Lord Jesus Christ was separated from the father so that you and I might never be separated. Yes. An eternal salvation. Then one day united all the family. All of God's children drawn home to glory. That will be a wonderful time. Those believers that we took Bibles to in China. My wife had the privilege of taking Bibles across into China. And they went right through China up into North Korea. Meet some of those from North Korea in heaven that we sent a Bible to. Ah, wonderful. Division, death, your death, my death. We talked about someone's death earlier, but what about our death? One day the call will come and the fear of dying. Where, when, how's it going to happen? Well, the child of God, we leave that in God's hands. He took the vinegar And it was part of our redemption and part of our salvation. And it's part of the plan for your life and my life. The sting of death is gone, friend. The sting of death is gone. This future event, Stephen said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Old John Wesley, when he was dying, he says, best of all, God is with us. Neander said, I'm going to sleep now. Good night. Mm, Wonderful. Thomas Scott said, this is heaven begun. 
And what did Paul say? I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. Friend, let me say, for the child of God, death is in front of us. Surely everyone must die. But for the child of God, that old hymn, safe in the arms of Jesus. Wonderful. Well worth being saved this morning. Well worth it. There's the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes to Calvary. He fulfills all the scripture, the Son of God, yet Son of Man. And there as he cries out, he says, I thirst. And, and he's fulfilling the last part of Calvary. And they give him vinegar to drink. He understands when you and I are given the vinegars of life, the bitterness of life, the bitterness in bereavement, betrayal, poverty, pain, death, division. He understands when we say goodbye to a loved one. My, his strength is made perfect weakness. It's interesting there'll be no sea in heaven. Many of you have families and friends across the sea. No sea in heaven. No division. No parting. Oh, the joy of God's salvation. The God, joy of sins forgiven. Peace with God. Oh my, it just can't be explained. He's not angry with his children anymore. He loves us. He chastens us. He guides us. He instructs us. He wants to be with us. He's taken the life's bitternesses. He's taken the bitterness out of all our situations. To go through life without Christ must be an awful feeling. But then you say to me, Now, Mr. Baxter, how long? Why have I so many pains? Why do why the cancer? What, 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 look, there's a wee woman, a friend of ours, and she died a terrible death of cancer, and she's a god. Why did that happen? Well, I believe there's two reasons for you and I having pains and problems and sicknesses and all those things. It's for our sanctification to draw us closer to Christ. That's one thing. To draw us close to the Savior. But there's another reason. Let me explain this one. Raymond was a friend of mine. He had MS, multiple cirrhosis. 35 years he had it. He went into the old people's home for a while because he had to get special care. He was so poorly. But in Raymond's room, I would go in and see him and his wife would be there and the children would be there. And the next room, there's an old boy, Bobby. And he loved to drink alcohol. <laughs> he just loved it. And I would speak into Bobby and I'd say, well, Bobby, how are you? I'm fine, your reverence. What are you at today? And we would have a wee chat and I would read with them and pray with them and nip in and see Raymond and chat to him and read and pray and go away. This went on for a long time. But then Raymond got worse and he went to hospital. And I was with Raymond when he died that night. Peace of God. The little ra radio playing hymns in the background. It's a little foretaste of heaven, friend. So a couple of days later, I went back into the old people's home and I went in to see Bobby. And I said, well, Bobby, how's it going today? Reverend, sit down, I want to talk to you. I said, what do you want today, Bobby? He was sober. He looked at me and he says, I want to die like Raymond. And he started to cry. I want to die like Raymond, he says. I need Raymond's Savior. And there that day, Bobby trusted the Lord as his Savior. Why did Raymond suffer so much? That Bobby might be saved. Why did Raymond go to the old people's home and be put in a ward next door, in a room next door to Bobby? That Bobby might be saved. I knew Bobby. Bobby's wife died some years previous and she was saved. And that was an answer to his wife's prayers. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I thirst. They gave him vinegar to drink, the last insult, the last hurt, that he might take you and I through 
rejoicing. He's taken the sting out of death. He's taken the sting out of our worries, our problems, our difficulties. And he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen.